all of the saints, whether they are canonized saints or just your, you might say, your average mill-of-the-run saints, those that were never canonized, which saints like you and I hope one day to be, they, all of them, remember that they once formed, as we do now, a part of the church militant. That they, as we, had to struggle long and hard against the world, against the devil, and against their own passions and their flesh in order to gain heaven and in order to be part of the church triumphant. They are now in heaven, the close friends of God. They share in the very life of their Creator. They share in His own happiness and are very much honored and loved by Almighty God. And so it is because of that that they have a great influence with Him. And they know with the greatest confidence that God will not refuse to grant whatever they ask. Furthermore, all of these saints in heaven are zealous for Almighty God's glory and desirous to see Him loved and served by all men and by all nations. Then they also take a very deep interest in us, even individually, they take a very deep interest. For we, like them, were redeemed by the death of the Son of God. And so, they have a great desire to see all men saved and become their companions in heaven. They want to spend their heaven with you. And so they rejoice with Christ whenever they see one sinner doing penance. And they pray for us day in and day out that we might one day end up in heaven. In other words, the saints are always ready to help us by their prayers. And God surely will hear the prayers of his saints since he promised that to grant even to us sinners whatever we would ask for in his name, he would grant. If he makes that promise to sinners, why would he not answer the prayers of those friends of his that can no longer sin? But nobody in heaven is more willing to pray for us than the very mother of God herself. She, more than all the saints more than all the angels, wishes to see her own divine Son served by all men for whom he shed his blood. And then, moreover, she possesses greater influence and power with God than all of the saints and the angels combined. When you read in the lives of the saints the power that the saints had when they prayed, and miracles were worked, mountains were moved, and heresies were destroyed and wiped from the face of the earth. And the greatest of sinners, who all else had despaired for his conversion, they would be converted by the prayer of a saint. And if you combine all of them, the prayers of the saints and angels, our ladies is still much more powerful. For they are servants and friends of God, but Mary is God's own mother, and God cannot refuse His mother anything. And so therefore, we have every reason to confide in her for us. Just as Pope Pius XII once said so beautifully, Is she not your mother? Tell her everything with confidence. We have in today's gospel an example of Mary's readiness to help the needy and her power with Christ, her son. It is the marriage feast of Cana. Our Lord and his disciples 
and even Mary, were all invited to take place in this great feast, this great party. You see the charity of our Lord himself, God, that he would take part in the celebration of marriage. But first, we must ever, we must understand this, that every action of our Lord Jesus Christ on earth had a definite purpose. He did nothing that was useless. He did nothing for vain reasons. No act was useless. It had a definite purpose arranged from all eternity. They were not done for mere show either. He would not even work his miracles just for show. Remember in the Passion, when Herod begged him for a miracle, our Lord stood there with his eyes closed, would not even respond, and certainly would not work a miracle because he did not do those things for show. He did it for a purpose. And so the purpose of his first miracle in which at this marriage feast he changed water into wine, was not merely to come to the aid of the married couple or to gain his disciples' confidence. It was rather to show his mother's kind heart and to and her great influence over him. Jesus had not yet begun his public ministry. He had not yet begun to preach or work miracles. But behold, Our Lady is at the scene. She calls His attention. She does not beg for anything, but Our Lady calls His attention to the fact that the wine has run dry. There is no wine, is all she says. But Christ seems to repulse her. Woman, what is this to me and to thee? In our language, if you just say, address someone as woman, it's kind of rude. You might get slapped in the face to it for it too. <laughs> but in that day and age, woman was equivalent to my lady, a title of great respect and great reverence. So our Lord calls his mother, my lady, and says, what is that to me and to thee? My hour has not yet come. That is, the hour to work miracles is not here. But pay attention. When our Lord acts in his official capacity of Savior, as he is about to do now, he pays no attention to titles of relationship. He does not call her on this occasion mother, but lady. When he was 12 years old and stayed behind in the temple and Mary and Joseph didn't know it, Father, she said, why have you treated thy father and I this way? And our Lord says, did you not know that I must be about my father's business? God, his father. But on this occasion, he gives a more honorable title of lady, is more honorable than mother, to show how great is her power and influence over his sacred heart in all that concerns our salvation. So he says, my hour is not yet come. Again, because he had not yet begun his public ministry of preaching. And so there was no need for him to work a miracle. Miracles are worked in order to give signs that the one who works them, what he teaches is true. That is the purpose of a miracle. And so there was no need to work a miracle on this case, in this case to prove the truth of what he taught. So why did he listen to Mary's request and work his first miracle ahead of time? It was for this reason, one author says, to show the great influence that Mary had over him, that he could, she could have the power of making him speed up his miracles, that she could obtain all that she asked, 
not excluding the greatest of miracles. But notice, too, the confidence that Our Lady had when she asked Our Lord for that favor. When Our Lord says, Woman, what is it to me and to thee? She doesn't look downcast. She immediately turns to the waitress and says, Do whatsoever Jesus tells you. She has such confidence that our Lord will hear the prayer that she just turns to them, do whatever he says, and they obey. And the power that she exercised that day in Cana of Galilee, we must remember, is exercised every day in heaven where she reigns over the saints and angels and is honored by God far above them. She works miracles in so many people's lives. How many, ta- how many of you are here, you found your way out of the Novus Ordo, simply because you preserved some devotion to the Blessed Virgin Mary? Almost every single time that I see a new convert from the Novus Ordo, And I ask them what devotions they preserved. Without fail, it is the the devotion to the Blessed Virgin Mary, particularly the Rosary. How many deathbed conversions she wins when souls have one foot already in hell. They have lived a life of mortal sin after mortal sin, and yet at the last instant, they call on the name of Mary and she comes to their aid. We will be so surprised when we get to heaven and we see all of the men that we thought were such great sinners and died such a horrible death that we will see them in heaven because they extended their hand to the Blessed Mother and she took it and she pulled them into heaven even if it was by the skin of their teeth. So the lesson is always this, to go to Our Lady in all things. Her prayer is infallibly heard by her Divine Son. Whatever she asks is always granted. This is not just a nice saying, sort of poetic. It is the truth of our faith. So go to her as the great means which our loving God has given us as the great means of salvation. When you sin, run immediately to the Blessed Virgin Mary and ask her to give you the contrition that you need to be forgiven your sins in the grace of a good confession. Ask her in moments of weakness to make you strong against temptation. Whatever it is that you need, tell your mother everything and she will give it to you. This is the one of the things that I, as your pastor, would love to see in every one of you, from the youngest child to the oldest man sitting in these pews today, a deep and tender devotion to the mother of God. For I am so convinced that if you follow my advice on this, imitate her example, pray to her, then we will, all of us who are in these pews today, every single one of us will meet again in heaven where we will thank Our Lady for all of the graces that she has given us in this life and that together with the Mother of God, we will worship the face of Almighty God in the Blessed Trinity. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.